I'm teaching a subject today that's I've never taught on before. And the Lord, I think pastor told us a couple months ago, right? So I've been thinking about this for about that long. And this subject kept coming up to me and I thought, I don't want to talk about that. I'd rather talk about something to be really wonderful and everybody be really excited about. And you will be when we're done. (laughs) But it just kept coming up to me. And I thought, how can I share that in a loving way to make you realize the reason we're here? It's the reason we're here. And I called it Grab the Rope. You ready? Remember, you have to love me. (laughs) If you're cold, you have to love me. If you're hot, you have to love me. Okay. We're going to go to Psalm 103.1. Mr. Joe, I'm going to read a portion of Psalm 103 to you, and you're going to get so excited. You're going to love this scripture. I'm reading it in the Amplified Classic. If you want to put it up there, Joe, that'd be great. Okay. We're just going to take our time and read this. Bless, affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is deepest within me, bless his holy name. Bless, affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord, O my soul. Forget not one of all his benefits, who forgives every one of all your iniquities, who heals each one of all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and corruption, who beautifies, dignifies, and crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies your mouth, your necessity and desire at your personal age. I like that part because my age is getting very personal. (laughs) Your personal age and situation with good so that your youth renewed is like the eagles, strong, overcoming, and soaring, The Lord, you know, a lot of people stop there. We're going to read the next two verses, okay? Ready? The Lord executes righteousness and justice, not for me only, but for all who are oppressed. Verse 7 is the one I want to talk about. He made known his ways of righteousness and justice to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. I want to talk to you today about how a lot of people in the body of Christ are excited about his acts. They want to go to an exciting service and see all kinds of exciting music. We have great music here, right? We got good music here. I've never worked with a better worship team, and I've been doing that for 65 years, 63 years. I was 10. So, (laughs) yeah. I've been playing in church for 63 years. So I've seen a lot of people come and go. I've seen a lot of people who were really interested in the acts because they wanted to be noticed for all of their musical ability, but they really didn't know God's ways. His ways are that we don't care if we're noticed for our music ability. We just get up and do what the Lord called us to do, right? Right. So we're going to talk about that. I said, isn't that a fun scripture, though? When you first start out and it's, oh, there's, it's a scripture that makes us happy, lifts us up, convinces us of everything that Jesus died to give us. He died to make us righteous. He died so that we could be healed and whole and have great relationships. But some people don't know his ways. It's important to know his ways, right? We live in a culture where everybody wants to be great. And so I'm going to talk to you about goats. And it's not, it's not in the context of, I was reading in the Word this week, you know, sheep and goats, how the Word talks about that. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about what our culture calls a goat. Does anybody know? Greatest of all time. Right. And so I've seen a lot of people in my lifetime that people consider to be greatest of all time. One of them is Michael Jordan. He's a great player. I don't really know if he's the greatest of all time, but some people would tell you that. Anthony might think that, actually. 
<laughs> I don't know. And then there's Tiger Woods. I used to love, even though I'm not athletic at all, ask the other five people in my family. They will tell you I live in a family of athletes and uh-uh, I play the piano, that's it. So sometimes it's kind of hard to live with people like that who, who are so much better at you than everything else. I mean, we're, we could be in the pool and I don't even catch a ball right when they throw it to me, you know? And they laugh at me, but that's okay, I don't care. Because that's not who I am, okay? But I like to get soaked in the pool, it's okay. <laughs> and so Tiger Woods, I used to enjoy watching him every week with you and Anthony. And you just knew when it came down to the final thing, he was going to win. You know, it was that way. Anybody remember the 65, excuse me, 75 and 76 Cincinnati Reds? That's the way you felt about them. It could be in the bottom of the ninth, and they could be five runs behind, and you would think they're going to win, right? Because they were so great. They were a great team together. And then there's Tom Brady, whom I really don't care for because he's not a Bengal. But, <laughs> but you have to admire him. He eats right. He works out. And you can count on. It could be the two minutes left in a football game. See how I've learned about sports after all these years? You could be in the last two minutes of the game, and he could be down even 10 points, and you really think he's going to win. And he does a lot of times. So he's great. I want to ask you today, how great are you? See, I told you you had to love me by the end, okay? <laughs> Jesus gave us a great lesson in being a goat. Let's look at Mark 10. We'll go over to Mark 10, verse 35. Verse 35. Let's see. I'm in the wrong place here. I'm not. Let's go on up to verse 43. I made a lot of notes for this. Jesus talking. It shall not be among you, he's talking about lordship, but who, whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. Verse 43 and 44. Yes. Let's look at Matthew 2311. Matthew 2311. I had so many people I wanted to point out here. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. How about that? Matthew 25, 14. I'm going to read several verses here. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered them unto him, them his goods to one. You know the story. He gave five talents to another two, another one. And you all know the story. I don't have to read the whole thing. But when he came back, when he came back in verse 40, I'm sorry, verse Hello. Verse 16, he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them another five talents. And likewise, he that received two also gained another two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained 
and then the one with the two did the same thing. And we'll see for those two in verse 23, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And we know the one that had the one talent was afraid because he thought his master was harsh. And so he hid it. And Jesus wasn't happy with him. You know, I think sometimes because of the culture we live in, we look at people with, that we perceive to have talent. And we think, I could never be like that. I never have anything to give. But you have so much to give. And I told you, remember, I told you we're going to tell you today why, why the church exists. This church was founded on two things, the love of God and the word of God. Amen. And the fact that we could show love to everybody who came in here and that we could teach the word without measure. And we could teach people what Jesus did for them, who he made them to be so that they could be led of the spirit and know what he made them to do. Now, all of you have been made to do something, but you'll never know exactly what it is until you decide to act like and be the person he made you to be. That's, that's what's complicated. It can get very complicated because people think, oh, I'm going to go to church. I'll be there every week. I'll be there on Wednesday night. You should be here on Wednesday night. Wednesday night's good, isn't it, Joel? It's good. It's good. Sunday night's good. Prayer meeting's good. I don't come just because my son's the pastor. If it wasn't good, I probably wouldn't show up. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm telling you, it's only good because of the love of God yes. and the word. Yes. I've Some of these stories you may have heard before, so just listen because there's somebody here who hasn't, okay? But I remember... I was standing on that side of the hall out there talking to a lady, and there was a bunch of ladies over here. And that lady looked down the hall, and she said, do you know how good it is to come to this church on Sunday morning and not think that those women are talking about me? What I'm wearing, how I look, my personality. What a wonderful testimony, you guys. I hope you guys feel the same way. I don't care what you have on when you come in. Now, some of you'd look better with longer pants than shorter. I mean, you know, be wise in what you wear. <laughs> but the, the thing that's important is how we come across to people. And if we don't come across to people in love, we may as well stay home on Sunday morning. Amen. Just stay home. You know, don't stay home. Come back next week. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> don't stay home. Um. When Anthony was eight, there was a musical series for kids called Salty, P-S-A-L-T-Y, Salty the Singing Songbook. <laughs> I don't know if he's watching or not, but okay, so he got the part of Salty because he could sing even when he was eight. He didn't think he can sing, but he can sing. Ask mom, he can sing, okay? Okay. Um, so I'm going to read this here. I went to the grocery. I got a big box that cereal had been shipped in, you know, like 20 boxes of cereal. And I painted it and made a book because he was going to be a singing song book, okay, with me. And I put gold letters, salty, on the book. But I'll never forget. <laughs> also, I'm going to tell you, it was the cutest thing you've ever seen, an eight-year-old in a book, in a box, <laughs> singing on stage. And the stage was smaller than this one. And as he walked from one side to the other, he fell off the stage. <laughs> it's like, okay, Salty's gone. <laughs> Get up. <laughs> Get up. <laughs> and, um, but the song that he sang was, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, Learn to be the servant of all. It was all about servanthood. 
And that song has gone through my head over and over and over through the years. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Now, some of you, if you've been selfish your whole life, none of you are probably like that. <laughs> Look at the camera. Some of you, if you've been selfish your whole life, might have to learn to be a servant. Some people are kind of born that way, right? I, I know I've gone through a lot of things like this. My sister, one of my sisters in love is here today. And I've made a lot of meals at my house through the years. And have you? Maybe you've made meals for big groups of people at your house. <laughs> I think I've had as many as 40 or 50 people in my house before. My mom was great at that. She was wonderful. It didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter in the 80s that she didn't have a dishwasher and you and I stood and washed dishes for two hours. But she was really good at doing a meal for 50 people. And uh, I learned that from her. But have you ever had even like a small meal with 10 people there and your sister-in-law? Not this one. <laughs> Not this one. They just sit there and they never say, what can I do to help you? Have you ever had somebody like that in your house? Which, I've been to people's house and I say, how can I help you? And they say, no, it's okay, we've got it covered. You know, maybe they don't want you in your kitchen, but when you've, what did I say I did? I went, I shopped, I cleaned, I cooked the meal, I set the table, and I set a table. <laughs> Do I set a table? Yeah. Because I figure if the table's pretty, they won't notice the taste of the food. It's real easy. It's real easy. <laughs> and then I gathered the dirty dishes, which he undoubtedly stood up and helped me do. And no one said a word about helping. None of them go to this church, okay? But it just indicates a lack of understanding of how to serve somebody. You know? Something to think about. Let's look at Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 19. Oh, I love this part. I'm going to tell you about a wonderful man. You know, some people are really good helpers. When I went to Africa with... Brother Roberts, <laughs> I would call him President Roberts, but you don't go to ORU, so it's okay. I'll say Brother Roberts. Um, Philippians 2.19. He's talking about Timothy, I trust the Lord Jesus to send Timothy as shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. In other words, how you are. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Amen. So it's not a recent problem. There have always been people who fall in love with Jesus so much that they want to serve. Yes. And there have always been people who know Jesus just enough. Remember about knowing his acts or his ways? If you know his ways, you know what a servant he is. He was the greatest of all time. He was the greatest of all time servants. But they only know the acts. Only there for the frills. Only there for the donuts with dad. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Joel would never be like that. Some people come for the frills. If you're one of those people today, you can change. You can learn. You can learn to give and love. And I'm not just talking about money, although that's part of it. Because where your treasure is, your heart will be. Where your treasure is, if your treasure is in telling people about Jesus, your heart's going to be there all the time. 
you know, we, I have to check my heart sometimes. I'm tired. I'm tired. Sometimes people leave. Sometimes people leave that told you you were wonderful for five years. And I go thinking, hmm, I must not be so wonderful anymore. <laughs> Something happened. What did I do? You know, but, but they're going to do what they do. We're going to do what the Lord called us to do. And we're going to love people and we're going to preach the word. Now, <laughs> I wanted to tell about the guy that was in our home group. Not now. Uh, we have a great home group. Hi. We have great leaders. They're back there right now in our home. But this is, um, I want to say, 25 or 30 years ago. The church we were attending there had home groups, and we had the Lebanon home group in our home. And there was this man who came to our church, and he was actually involved in the music. He was one of those people that I told you about in the music ministry. <laughs> He was in the music ministry in our church, and he came to our home group two or three weeks, and I'll never forget in the hall of the church, he stood in front of Gary and he said, I love you, man. I'm going to be your friend the rest of your life. <laughs> he was gone in about two weeks. <laughs> he was gone, just gone. I remember he called me because I was playing keyboard then. And he called me and he said, I don't like the way the music's going. I said, really? Well, I'm not in charge of the music. He said, talk to the pastor and his wife and tell them that it needs to happen this way. I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. You think I'm going to betray my pastor and tell you <laughs> go tell him something just because you want it? Maybe that's why he didn't come back. <laughs> I don't know. But we were better off, weren't we? We were better off. It was funny. I've met many other people who are there no matter what. Yeah. Carol Burnett's one of them. Amen. No matter what. Yeah. I don't want to embarrass you, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> she suffered the loss of her life this year. I was here yesterday studying, and Carol was here bringing in water. Did you know Carol brings the water in? How many knew that? Raise your hand if you knew Carol brings the water in. So if you have water every week, Carol's the one that's been bringing it. She puts special big ones for the worship team. Because see, we need the big ones because we sweat on the back of our neck. <laughs> I love you guys. I love you guys. Thank you for putting up with me this morning. Do you see that after you've served the Lord 63 years or whatever, you better have a sense of humor <laughs> about the things that happen in churches, the people who come and go. That doesn't change who you are. You know, I think Pastor Anthony has said before one of the things that I said to him as he was growing up is integrity is doing the right thing oh, yeah. because it's the right thing right. and doing it right. It doesn't matter who's looking. Amen. It doesn't matter. Those days that Judy's in here, Judy was here yesterday too. She was putting your toilet paper in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> She's a servant. Yeah. Yeah, She's there every week smiling at you. I could go around and mention 25 of you. Rick over there? That, that, not, I love you, Rick. <laughs> Jennifer's mom, dad. But Rick over here, when he comes in to practice on Sunday mornings, he comes over immediately, first thing he does, and gives me a hug. He's one of my sons. I'm probably old enough to be his mother. <laughs> do you understand? Church is a family. Yeah. Yes. We do for each other like we do for a family. Yes. We're the family, and we need to bring other people into the family. Yeah. There are so many people. I've worked at children's services with Miss Tricia over there for several years. 
so many hurting people in this, in this community. I used to say, when I came into work, I'd say, this is a parallel universe. All the people in these subdivisions around here, they have no idea what's going on in some places in this community. Yep, yes. Because people need the love of God in their hearts, Amen. in their lives. It's the only thing that will change them, change them from the inside out. Once you understand how much Jesus loves you, how could you not? How could you not play or sing? I'm not a worship leader. I know who I am. I'm an accompanist, <laughs> and I sing. But it's not comfortable for me to stand up there this morning and do what Anthony does, because that's not who I am. But it had to be done today. So we go do it. And I think it turned out pretty well. Yes. Yeah. It was good. It was good. You guys really entered in today. It was a good day. It was a good day. We have so many talented musicians with us. I'm totally impressed every week. I could go down the list to tell you. But the main thing I could tell you, their pastor is their leader. And because of that, there are times we don't get to have regular practices, like if there was a music pastor. Because pastor has a lot of things to do, and sometimes it's canceled. Our worship team, never they never complain. They go with the flow. They do what they need to do. And when they come in here on Sunday morning, they're ready to minister to you. Yeah. And they're, they're just ready. And I see the people, did you know? You're gonna, okay, I know you're going to laugh now. I think I was here four years in this building before I ever saw the parking lot in any way but empty because I come in and unlock on Sunday morning and then I usually lock when I leave. So I'd never seen the parking lot full. So I walked out one Sunday and I said, Gary, I wanna see what the parking lot looks like when there's people here. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm looking around and all your cars, it was just blessing me because there's people here. People are what it's about. Amen. Say it again. Say it with me. People are what it's about. <laughs> oh, I love you guys. I could preach as long as my son does, but we'll see. From my observation, the only way to serve with a pure heart is found in Luke 5. Simon, Peter, we're not going to go there, but when Jesus told him to cast his nets, no, he was the fisherman. You see, you know, I think of the Gordon. Remember the commercial for the Gordon's fisherman? <laughs> fisherman. I'm a fisherman. You're just a Bible teacher. I'm a fisherman. He said, we fished all night. We didn't get anything. He said, nevertheless, at your word, I will do it. Now, that's what I think servi servitude is. Not servitude, that's not a good word. Seems like it's made to be. But that's what a servant is. Yeah. Nevertheless, at your word, at your word, yeah. at your word, at your word. Mike, at your word. Thank you for playing today. Mike kept me going today. <laughs> so look at it. Four sticks, Mike, do the four sticks. <laughs> Get us going. Let's look at some servants in the Bible. Let's look at Ruth 1. Ruth 1. Hey, you know, so I don't have to go there. You're going to bring it up for me. Joseph 1.16. 1, 1.16. Y'all know the story of Ruth. This was my favorite when I was a little girl. I had a book. It was like, it was written like a novel, but it was the story of Ruth, and it was called The Song of Ruth. And... I probably read that because, because I wasn't an athlete, okay? I probably read 50 books a summer when I was in school. I love to read, and I probably read, I probably read that book 20 times about Ruth. I think I wanted to be like her. He said, and Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. 
For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And then it goes on. She says, where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. She's talking to her mother in love. I know you've seen it on wedding invitations, <laughs> but she's talking to her mother in love. She was from a different country than Israel. Her, she had met the mother's son in that country in Moab, and they had married. Y'all know the story. Um, for those of you that never went to Sunday school, I'm telling you the story. Okay. Um, and she, she said, whatever, whatever, I'm going with you. I'm not going to stay with these people here. I'm going to go where you go. She said, your God's going to be my God, and nothing's going to part us except death. And she became part of the lineage of Jesus, the kin kinsman redeemer redeemed her, and Boaz married her, and she became in the lineage of Jesus. Just because she followed what she thought was right with her mother in love. We say mother in love. Because there's no law that can make you love your mother in law. <laughs> you can't love your mother in law without love. Amen. Right. Right. Now, I know Anthony loves his mother in love. And Jennifer loves me. So it all works that way. You know why? Because of the love of God. Right. right? Everybody's different, you guys. We're all different. And, and when we come into families and into a church family in particular, you're going to learn people. You're going to meet people that maybe aren't like you at all. You care if I use you? I will use you. Okay. <laughs> My friend Trisha said she wanted to work on the camera because it's the camera that brought her to the church. Good. Good. Amen. Powerful. She also said, this is very personal, I, I, but it's so good. It's so good. When she started coming after a month, she private messaged me one time. She said, I love the church, something like this. I love the church, and I'm so glad to be there. She said, I didn't know what to do about people telling me they love me. She said, actually, the first time Pastor Anthony said it to me, I said, thank you. <laughs> I love that. I love it so much. You are so real. And think about that. The people who walk in here, they're not used to that. Amen. We're used to children's services, people messing up their families, trying to help them out of it. We're, we're used to maybe, I don't know, arguments at work, arguments in your family sometimes, maybe. But if it's founded on the love of God, there doesn't need to be any of that. Because I, I mean, you heard us say it over and over. When we got married, it doesn't matter what he thinks. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the word says. Now, there's been sometimes, you know, we said the sun's never going to go down on our wrath. Sometimes it was three in the morning before we settled it, but we settled it. <laughs> and we came into agreement because if we don't agree, according to the word, if we don't agree, then there's trouble. Yeah. There's trouble. And so pray. I remember when we were in other churches where we didn't know the pastor as well as we know this one, um, <laughs> things would happen. And I remember Gary always said, I haven't prayed about that as much as they have. So I'm not going to criticize it. When the leadership has prayed about something and thinks that that's the direction to go, it's good. You can come tell us what you think about anything, but pray about it. Pray for us. Pray for the people in the church to receive people coming in in the kind of love that we've been told is here, yeah. right? Because yeah. we have to continue that. You know, there were other servants in the Old Testament. Esther was a servant. She was going to be queen, and she took a chance 
to save her people from beheading. And the guy who was coming against her and them was killed himself because he was an evil man. There's evil in the land. You saw some evil this week. There's evil. If you don't have the word of God as a standard in your life to say the word over your kids, believe not that those people didn't, would never insinuate that. I don't mean that. There's evil in the land. And God wants to protect us, take care of us in everything, in prosperity, in our, in our finances, in our relationships. If you're looking for a relationship, if you want to get married, one of the books I read when I was still wanting to get married. I was wanting to get married. I remember when Tiffany was wanting to get married. <laughs> you're great. <laughs> I remember I read something that said marriage is not so much about finding the right person as it is being the right person. And that really changed my life. And then Joseph, he was sold, <laughs> put in a prison because an evil woman lied about him. But then he became able to save his family from famine. I mean, there is just story after story after story that were about servants about servants that would rather die than do the wrong thing for the people who were in charge over them. Aaron served Moses because he believed in his calling. He's all through Exodus talking to Pharaoh. And then there was Aaron and Miriam. I remember them holding up Moses' arms during one of the battles because it took that. It took that. Maybe it was another time. Anyway, maybe it was Joshua. I don't know. I didn't look that one up. There's Gideon, 300 guys who drank water the correct way. <laughs> so they got, to, they got to be in a battle that was won because they were serving. Second yeah. Kings 2, we're not going to turn there, talks about Elijah and Elisha. And, and, and he, Elijah wanted to get away from Elijah, Elisha. And he said, no, I'm not going to leave you. He said, I'm not going to leave you. So he followed him to Bethel and Jericho. You should read the story. It's an interesting story. He asked, and then before Elijah left this planet, he asked Elijah for a double portion of his spirit, which we have not even more than now. We don't have Elijah's spirit. We have the Holy Spirit Amen. to tell us what to do and where to go. Each step, each step of the way. And then we're going to talk about this is my person that you're thinking, what does grab the rope mean? What does grab the rope mean? Let's look at Acts 9 in the New Testament. Verse 22. Okay, Saul, you know the story of Saul who became Paul. He killed Christians. Have you ever killed a Christian? I've never killed a Christian. Well, sometimes I felt like a Christian was killing me with their words, but I've never, I've never. You know, I'll know the story. He was blinded. Ananias went to pray for him. And then in verse 22, it says, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. Did you ever think about who was holding the rope? Somebody was holding the rope, letting him down in the basket. I've had many people throughout my life hold a rope for me. 
my mom when I was in college. We've talked before about how um, President Roberts helped me with tuition. One of the reasons was there was a lot of trouble going on at home. In 45065, there was a lot of trouble. It was better out 7777 South Lewis in Tulsa. It was better out there. It wasn't too good here. It was so bad that for a year or so, my mother didn't have a telephone. So she would go to Hopkinsville, exactly close to where that gold star is up there now. Y'all know in Mainville? You call it Mainville now. We just call it Hoptown. Uh -huh. Anybody remember Hoptown? Yeah. But there was a payphone there. She would call me in the dorm after curfew and tell me what was going on. It was bad. And I think about how she held that rope for me. She held the rope for me. She thought I could do anything. Probably that's why I had to do so much. But I think she died too young. She had a lot of hard times. But there's one thing for sure. She adored her children. She adored your husband. I was sitting on the hospital bed by her a couple days before she died. And she said, I said, Mom, I love you. I'm going to go home. I love you. She said, I adore you. She said, I would give my life for you. I told that story to Anthony, and he said, Mom, she did. I'm sorry, I didn't plan this part. There are times that I'm sitting over there on Sunday morning, and I'm watching my son preach. And I think, oh, if mom could be here to see that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If she could see that Avery's learning to play the drums. If she could see Tiffany's children, even Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Mike. You know I love you so much. I appreciate you, Mike. She would love to cook biscuits and gravy for you. Thank you. See, that was a servant right there. Thank you. I just want you to get a handle today on why we do what we do. Yeah. Gary's crying. <laughs> why do we do what we do? Why did you come to church today? Why did you come to church? You could have gone to brunch. <laughs> brunch is good. You know, when I used to work at children's services, I would, I would kind of go in on Monday morning and, and um, I hear everybody talking about what they did on the weekend and they went to the Bengals game, which is fine. I mean, our family goes to Bengals games. Okay, but... I would think, man, if I didn't go to church two times on Sunday, it, it'd be like Sunday was a Saturday, a second Saturday. And I'd think, wow, they have all this time to get a break and rest and have brunch on Sunday. <laughs> and here I am going to church on Sunday morning at 8.30 and practicing and going to church and and go home, maybe get an hour's little nap because I fall asleep in my chair and go back to church on Sunday night. I'm thinking, man, that brunch on Sunday wouldn't be too bad. It'd be kind of nice. You know why I don't? I don't because of you. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Every pastor on this staff and 
Laura, who is our faithful person yeah. in the office. We love you. We want the best for you. We want prosperity for you. We want good relationships for you. We want your bills to be paid next month without you fussing and fuming about them. We want the best job God has for you. We want relationships. Okay, you guys back there, if you want a wife, we want you to get a wife someday. (laughs) You know, we want the best for you, the very best. The very best is staying in the love of God and the word of God and learning to be the servant of all. That's the very best. I'm telling you, it's just the best. Oh, it's fun. It's not worth anything if you're not serving people. It's really not. So, Mike, I'll make biscuits and gravy for you sometime. (laughs) Mine is, it's pretty good. And set the table pretty. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's other people we didn't know their names in mark 2 we find four guys who took a guy that was sick let's look at mark 2 you know we don't we don't know the name of the guy who gave the donkey to the disciples. I mean, can you imagine somebody, can you imagine Gary? I've imagined Gary many times. Can you imagine Gary coming to you out in the parking lot and saying, give me the keys to your truck. The pastor wants it. And you're probably not going to get it back. (laughs) That's what happened to the guy that owned the donkey. So have you ever thought about him? He just handed it over. We don't know his name. We don't know his name. Mark 2. 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Turn the page. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. There were four men carrying this guy. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. He raised him up. He was healed. Now, can you imagine? (laughs) Okay, so we have a home group in our house. Let's say, I mean, we've had the finishers there before, and maybe maybe 45 people in there. I don't know. But it's too full for you to come in, but you need prayer. (laughs) Can you imagine going up on our roof and saw it? And just letting them down in the middle of the house. I think Gary might have something to say about that. I'm not sure. (laughs) But the guy who owned the house, we don't know his name. We don't know his name. Nothing was said about them, except that they were okay with taking the roof off. (laughs) Just think about it. Think about the real people in the Bible, the real stories, what they went through. There's so many stories. I mean, seriously, I mean, you can think about Mary and an angel comes and tells her she's going to have a baby. I mean, what would you think? What would the people in your family say about Mary? I mean, be real about some of these things and the faith that people had to go on and serve and listen to the word of the Lord. Okay. Acts 16, 25. We don't know this guy's name either. I had so much fun looking up this stuff. I wanted to stay in the office all night. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. 
And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. He called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You know, we don't know his name either. But because of the character of Paul and Silas, that they could have run away. You see movies where something happens maybe to a prison or a jail, and everybody, whoosh, see ya, gone. But they had character, and they didn't leave because they had been put in there. And he saw that there was something different about them. They were servants, but then he became a servant. And so, see, servants beget servants. Like begets like. If you have been loved by Jesus, you're going to love people. And they're going to learn that they're loved by Jesus. That's how it works. That's how a church functions. It's how a family functions. Were we perfect parents? No. I remember, but admit you're not perfect. Just admit it. I remember one time, I think Gary and I said a couple of wrong things to each other. I think he was about three. And we took him and put him on the chair. And both of us got on our knees in front of him and said, son, we're sorry. We shouldn't act like that. Admit it. Just admit it and quit it. You know, I went to school and got a master's degree in counseling. All of these theories of counseling. Let's just go dig up everything from the past and all the horrible things that happened to you. I could give you a hundred horrible things that have happened to me. Do you really want to hear about that? (laughs) The best counseling theory is admit it and quit it. Just quit it. And you can say, well, that's just so hard because my mom hurt me so much. I said, well, okay. So God brought you through that. God brought you to where you are today. He gave you a Bible. He gave you friends in the church that can tell you about the things that God has brought them through, maybe about the mother that hurt them, but about God's healing power in their life to heal their relationships, to even, I've heard Joyce Meyer say, her dad was a horrible man, but God healed their relationship. They were friends before he died because of what God did in her life. So see, nothing nothing is so desperate that you can't overcome it. I promise you. There's nothing. You can lose everything that you have. Does that change who you are? It doesn't change who you are. It shouldn't change who you are. When people talk about you, and I think, hmm, well, I didn't think I did that. (laughs) But if you guys want to believe that, that's okay. Because God knows God knows who you are, what he called you to be, how he loves you, how he believes in you. He believes in you. He believes in you. He believes in you. Get excited about that. You know that song that we sing? He's for you. He's for you. Are you for you? Are you for you? Are you for you? I'm for me. Not in a selfish way, but I want to learn more about Jesus all the time and how he's for me. He loves me. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter how hard it is to raise kids now. It really doesn't matter. I remember in the the 80s, I would cry out to the Lord and I'd say, Lord, my grandma, she had 11 kids in the Depression. She made biscuits and gravy for them every morning. I've cooked for our family Thanksgiving dinner many years. And at that time, there's about 13 of us in the family. So that would be the size of grandma's family every day. 
And I'm talking about Thanksgiving dinner once a year. It's work. <laughs> That's really work. So you set the good table. <laughs> get, your pretty, get your pretty dishes out. You got to know how to do the fork. And the knife over here, it faces into the plate, not away you go. You guys have to learn how to set a table. <laughs> I'm setting a table for you today. Yeah. I'm setting a table for you today. The table is the table of the Lord and what he's calling you to do in this church. That's the table. Go home and pray about if you, many of you, so many of you are are involved in ministry here at the church. But if the Lord's been tugging at you, the Holy Spirit's been tugging at you, get involved, be a greeter, Um, help them out in the parking lot. Uh, We have people who mow the grass around here. I'm going to, I'm going to read to you in a few minutes. Just don't quit being who God made you to be. Okay, let's look at Luke 10. We're almost done. See? I'm not going to quite preach as long as he did, I think. Not sure. My mom, my son used to say to me, I remember one time he was a teenager, and he said, Mom, why are you always teaching? I said, well, I guess I'm just a teacher. Why are you always telling me something? Well, I'm just going to tell you. Know when to tell them. Know when to tell them. Luke 10. Are you over there yet? I love this story. And you know one of the reasons I love the story so much is because I used to really not like the story. All of you people who set the table right, you didn't like the story either. Tell the truth. Verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went, he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, this used to aggravate me (laughs) because I was the Martha. I mean, I sat at Jesus' feet too. But here's the thing. If I do a meal, I want people on time. I'm cooking. And believe me, when I cook, everything's hot at the same time. Okay. So if you come 20 minutes late, it's not fun because it's hard on the cook. So just remember that. Gary used to say, we hate late, okay? Don't be late. If somebody's invited you to eat at their house, be on time, okay? But one of the things I began to realize about this story, the point is not that Jesus didn't like Martha and he liked Mary. That is not the point of the story. And if if that's the way you're interpreting it, it's not, that's not the point of the story. The point is that if you're a Mary and you sit at his feet, and you learn of him all week long, when you cook on Sunday, you're going to have a different attitude about it. Your attitude's going to change because you're just there to serve. It doesn't matter if anybody gets up and helps you with the dishes. That's their thing. That's not your thing. Your thing is you're serving as unto the Lord. You do all things as unto the Lord. And then you don't even be concerned about what anybody else thinks about it. And then if everybody shows up and they want to sit and talk to Jesus for a while, you can always heat the food up. Right? It's not a big deal. All these things that we make a big deal about are not really a big deal. It's not. Tell you one more thing, you should laugh at me. Um, when I went to Africa, sorry to tell you that, but when I went there, we were trained before we went 
some phrases in Swahili, and we were told that we were going to go out in the bush country, they call it, which is way out. It's not Nairobi. And um, minister to little churches out there. Some of them didn't even have walls. They were just thatch roofs and stuff. And we were supposed to enjoy anything they gave us to eat and not act elitist like elitist Americans. Okay. And so we're out there one day and they offered us some milk. Now, I don't like milk from UDF. <laughs> my mom said I quit drinking milk when I was six. So milk sort of turns my stomach on any day. But I don't want to spoil your lunch, but the milk, <laughs> the milk was so bad that it, there were things floating on the top that looked like cottage cheese. And I looked at that and I thought, there's no way I can drink this. And one of the guys I'll never forget, his name was David, standing next to me, he's a real tall guy. He said, I'll take it, Diana. And I said, thank you. <laughs> I was 19, didn't know a lot, but I knew that I loved Jesus, and I knew that we were there to serve those people, and I didn't want to offend him. And he helped me out that day. He served me. See, there's just little ways that you serve people. Yeah. You don't have to be cumbered about what you're serving. Just allow your holiday meals to go the way that they go. If the kids take too long opening their gifts or cleaning up the wrapping paper. Who cares? Amen. Who cares about that? It's just wrapping paper. Why do we get upset about wrapping paper? Seriously. Why do we get upset about things like that? I love Mary. I just love Mary. Let's look at John 12. I'm almost done and everybody said amen. Amen. You can go cook your steaks and your stuff. Your steaks that cost a lot more than they used to, but <laughs> you're not going to complain about it because God meets your needs. Yes. Come on, guys. Right? Verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, <laughs> that's pretty cool, whom he raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was, see, there you go, Martha serving again. And Mary's not. <laughs> Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard. Spikenard. Very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Appointment. Now, Judas, he's a really wise guy. He was mad because he said that that ointment could have bought a lot of stuff. And in verse 5, he says, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. He wasn't going to feed the poor. He was going to take the money. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Mary knew. Martha was serving. And maybe she had learned a little bit about that by then. Martha was serving, but Mary was serving. There are different things we do to serve. What difference does it make if I unlock the door on Sunday morning? And you come in and you greet the people. I don't get to greet the people. There are things I don't get to do. Laura makes all these wonderful meals for us. <laughs> we have other people who cook for 180 or make desserts for 180. We cooked for 180 in our house for three years when we first started at 180 in 2011. The cooking was done at our house. 
And we carry those big things over there. And Cheryl and Jennifer and Anthony and I would stand behind the thing and serve. Remember those days? In the little community center. And then there came other people in the church that wanted to do that. So why would I say, you have to do it the way I do it? No, I want you to use your gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Use what God gave you to do. And all of you were given something to do. That's what's so wonderful about it. Mary was doing what she was supposed to do. And really, Martha, somebody had to cook, you guys. They didn't have McDonald's then. Somebody did have to cook. Okay, I'm going to close. I guess I did go that long. But I have something that I'm going to read to you word for word. I was in the office yesterday, and I thought, how do I close this out? And I hope you received everything I said in love today. All I'm saying to you is, show the love of Jesus. And if there's something that's in your heart, come talk to Pastor Joel or one of the pastors about some way you'd like to serve. If it's not time for you to do that, that's fine too. We're not going to ever condemn you for anything. Amen. Learn that about us. And I thought, and so I sat there. I said, Lord, how do you want me to close this? And I began writing. Ready? I'm going to read it to you. Ready? Are you ready? Okay. We have many rope holders in this church. From the time the door is unlocked, many servants give of themselves. In the parking lot, at the welcome door, in the nursery, at the information table, on the stage in worship, practicing for that worship, receiving the offering, teaching the children in another part of the building, picking up trash at the end of the service, preparing fellowship meals, decorating for those meals, and cleaning up afterwards, helping in vacation Bible school, making beautiful backdrops for pictures with our loved ones, counting the offering, operating the cameras, operating the sound system, clicking on scripture for all to see on the screen, cleaning the bathrooms, ordering materials for nursery, and children, teaching and helping in kids' church, interceding on the prayer team, supplying water for the people, mowing the yard, directing the live stream from the back room, thank you, Matt, ministering to the youth on Sunday evening, thank you, Joel, planting beautiful flowers, thank you, Richard, teaching the word and going deeper, sending the word of encouragement every week, helping the pastor minister in altar ministry, and turning off the lights and locking the door. I didn't even come close to listing them all. There are bunches more that happens during the office hours, during the week. Why do we do this? It's to show the ones who walk in the door that God loves them and that Jesus died on the cross to provide salvation, healing, and everything they need in life, spirit, soul, and body. That's why we serve. That's how we share the love of God. That's how we grab the rope and hold on to it. So I urge you today, if there's a rope of service that you need to grab, pray about it. Come talk to us about it. And please always know that we appreciate everything you do. A lot of the things that you do, the ones who were here in the early years, we've done all those things. And we love you. We appreciate you. I hope we say it to you enough. But if I live to be 100 and my son still pastors this church, I will never quit telling you how much I love you and appreciate you. You have changed my life in my 60s and 70s. The things that all those steps, not drinking that milk 
when I was 19. All of those steps in my life brought me to where I am today, and I appreciate you so much. Don't ever forget that and show that same appreciation to everybody who walks in here. You already do. I know you do. I love you. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in Him.